Here we're going to start looking at the calculus of functions, starting with the precise definition of a limit. So let's get to it. Given a function f from the real numbers to the real numbers, we say the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l if for all epsilon bigger than zero, so that is an arbitrary epsilon that's been given to you, there is a delta bigger than zero, so that means you can find a delta which will depend on that epsilon such that if x minus a is less than delta, then f of x minus l is less than epsilon, and those are within absolute values. So you wanna compare this to the notion of a limit of a sequence. So recall that had an arbitrary epsilon and then a capital N, which was a natural number, such that for all natural numbers larger than that, you achieved this maximum distance of epsilon. And so here it's a little bit different because we're looking at a function from the real numbers to the real numbers instead of a sequence. Okay, so this is a picture of that situation. So here we wanna think of this as maybe the graph of the function y equals f of x. And I should point out that it doesn't matter what's happening at the point x equals a. What matters is what's happening near the point x equals a. So the idea is that you're given some epsilon bigger than zero, which is like your goal. You want the function to be within epsilon of this limiting value. So in other words, it needs to be between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. And your goal is to find out how close the input value needs to be to A for this to happen. And so you wanna find a delta so that that will occur. And so let's go ahead and notice that if our x is there, and notice this x will satisfy the rule that x is between A minus delta and A plus delta, which is equivalent to saying that the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta. But notice if x is there, then notice we can bring this up and see that the f of x value will be right about here. So here, let's go ahead and write this f of x value. And notice that this f of x value is most definitely by our construction between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. But again, that's equivalent to the absolute value inequality, f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Okay, good. Now, I wanna give another formulation of this definition of a limit that has to do with epsilon neighborhoods before we look at an outline of writing one of these proofs and some examples. So here's another formulation. So the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l if for all epsilon bigger than zero, there is a delta bigger than zero such that, and I wanna say sometimes people put a little subscript of epsilon on this delta to say that this delta is gonna depend on this choice of epsilon. Now, if x is in the delta neighborhood centered at a, then f of x is in the epsilon neighborhood centered at L. So notice that this notion of a delta neighborhood and an epsilon neighborhood is equivalent to these inequalities, which is equivalent to this thing happening in the picture. Okay, so now that we've got this taken care of, let's look at the outline of an epsilon delta proof. So let's look at the outline of an epsilon delta proof. So the first thing that you wanna do is start with a guess for the value of the limit. And you should actually probably have a good feel for what the value of this limit should be from like a calculus one or maybe a calculus two class if it involves some L'Hopital's rule or something. Next, reduce the inequality. F of X minus L is less than epsilon. So you wanna start there and reduce it until it looks like X minus A is less than something. And those are within absolute values. And that something is going to almost definitely depend on epsilon. And that something is what you will call delta. And so that's all your scratch work. So I really wanna point that out. This second step is scratch. And so you would maybe do that in your notebook, but then when you're taking your homework up, you would not include this. Then finally, you wanna write the proof. And it should go like this. 
given epsilon bigger than zero, take delta equal to, well now you're just going to arrive at this thing that you calculated in the box during your scratch work, you're gonna put that right in the proof there. And then you wanna say something, observe that or notice that, and then you'll reverse the calculations in the second step, starting from here, so in other words, starting at x minus a is less than delta and ending at f of x minus l in absolute values is less than epsilon. Okay, so now that we've got this idea for the outline of one of these proofs, I'm gonna do two examples. So now let's look at our first example. So we're gonna show that the limit as x approaches three of two x minus one equals five. And so that's maybe a day one limit from a calculus class, so it's pretty simple, but we wanna look at it and prove it via this careful definition of a limit and the outline that I just showed. So we're gonna break this into two parts. First is the scratch work and then is the proof. In other words, what you would turn in. So this would just be in your notebook or on scratch paper or something and this is what you would type up probably in LaTeX and turn in as your homework assignment. So like I said, we wanna start with the absolute value of x minus l is less than epsilon, but we know what f of x is and we know what l is in this case. So here we have two x minus one minus five is less than epsilon. So here we have f of x minus l, great. Now we're gonna go ahead and simplify that. Notice that gives us two x minus six is less than epsilon. And then recall our goal was to get to this absolute value x minus a kind of thing. Notice it's not so hard to get there in this case because we can factor a two out. Notice when we factor a two out, we have the absolute value of x minus three is less than epsilon, which means absolute value of x minus three is less than epsilon over two. And that tells us that this is going to be our value of delta. Now we can go ahead and write the proof, which will involve like putting everything in complete sentences and essentially reversing all of this calculation. So you can always start with the same kind of setup whenever you're doing one of these. So given epsilon bigger than zero, we wanna set delta equal to, well, we just calculated that it needed to be epsilon over two. So I'll write that down, epsilon over two. And notice that if, x minus three is less than delta, which is equal to epsilon over two, then now we can do our calculation in reverse. So I can multiply both sides of this by two. That'll give us two x minus six in absolute values is less than epsilon. Um, and then I'll say maybe which implies the absolute value of 2x minus one minus five is less than epsilon. But notice that's exactly what we wanted to end with. So we can stop the proof right there. Or if you wanted to finish it off, you would maybe say, so the limit as x goes to three of 2x minus one equals five. Okay, great. So now I'll clean this up and we'll look at one more example. For our next example, we're going to show that the limit as x approaches four of x squared equals 16. So again, just like before, this is maybe a day one limit from a calculus one class, but that makes it good for practicing this new technique of proving this super carefully. So like we did before, we wanna start off with absolute value x minus l is less than epsilon, and hopefully end up down here with x minus a is less than delta, where this delta is something that we just calculated that is with respect to epsilon. Okay, so let's see what we have in our setup. So we wanna look at that absolute value of x squared minus 16 is less than epsilon. And somehow we want to work that down until we have the absolute value of x minus four is less than delta, where this is going to be something that is in terms of epsilon, like I just pointed out. Great. So by a difference of squares factoring, we can factor this into x minus four, x plus four, and that's kind of motivated by what's going on right here. So let's go ahead and do that. So we can write this as absolute value x minus four, absolute value x plus four, less than epsilon. Okay, great. And now it might seem like we should just divide this by the absolute value of x plus four, but that would be a problem because 
sure we would have have absolute value of x minus four on the left hand side but we would have a variable on the right hand side and so like i said that's a problem so what we want to do is somehow restrict the values of delta that we're interested in so that we can get a handle on this x plus four four term and we're going to do that in the following way so let's notice if delta equals one, which almost definitely delta will have to be less than one because generally we think about epsilon as being very, very small and delta also being very, very small. But if we were not so restricted and we said delta was equal to one, then x minus four in absolute values less than delta is the same thing as x minus four is less than one and greater than negative one because again delta is equal to one here which tells us that x is between five and three but the great thing about this is that this gives us a bound on the absolute value of x plus four Notice that means that the absolute value of x plus four is going to be less than nine. Great, and so that means that if we can stick the absolute value of x plus four being less than, less than nine to the right of this, then we're good to go. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and take this thing and replace it with the inequality absolute value of x minus four, and then I'm gonna replace that with a nine. I'll put it out front is less than epsilon. But that tells us that our delta in this setup should possibly be epsilon over nine. That seems to work out. But it's not just epsilon over nine. This epsilon over nine only works if delta is equal to one or if delta is less than one. Because notice if delta is less than one, then that's gonna put this x plus four strictly less than nine. Okay, so that means that our delta will be the minimum of epsilon over nine and one. So that's how we wanna finish this off. So let's look at the proof. Given epsilon bigger than zero, we wanna set delta equal to the minimum of epsilon over nine and the number one. And now what we want to do is suppose or maybe notice that if the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than delta, then we have two things happening. Then the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than 1 and the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than epsilon over 9. So that's what that minimum gives us, is that it turns into that conjunction statement and of those two inequalities. Okay, great. But now the fact that x minus four is less than one in absolute values tells us that the absolute value of x plus four is less than nine. Great, now what we can do is take this and plug it into this inequality, just multiplying the left-hand side by absolute value x plus four, the right-hand side by nine. Maybe I'll do it like this. Let's call this one and two. And so by one and two, we have absolute value of x squared minus 16, which is equal to absolute value of x plus four times absolute value of x minus four. That's, as, that's gotta be less than epsilon times epsilon over nine. And so this x plus four less than nine is from inequality one. And then this x minus four less than epsilon over nine is from inequality two. But now multiply those together and we get epsilon. But now looking at the extreme left and right hand side of the equality, we see that that finishes it off and tells us that the limit as x goes to four of x squared equals 16 as needed. And that's a good place to stop.